Hello, welcome everyone. We'll just wait a moment here while everyone logs in and then we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to the fourth installment of California Wine Institute's Inside California Winemaking. Thank you all for taking the time out to be with us today. In this webinar series, produced specifically for our key Asian markets, wine writer and educator Elaine Khan brown speaks with top California producers, bringing a bit of the vineyards and the cellars of the Golden State to our international audience. We've scheduled these webinars to best suit your time zones in the hopes that this hour in the day suits your schedules, and the guest vintners featured in this series have also been selected with you, our audience, in mind to bring you insights about wineries and wines that are present in your markets. Today, we have the privilege to welcome Greg Brewer of Brewer Clifton in the Santa Rita Hills. So before we get started, some housekeeping reminders for everyone. During the webinar, note that there are two communication methods available to participants that we encourage you to use, a chat section as well as a Q&A section. These are different. So the chat section is an informal way for you to communicate with other participants, uh, but be sure to select everyone in the to field as it can default to panelists only. And then there's the Q&A section, and this is where we'd like you to submit your questions for Elaine and Greg to answer during the webinar. We will do our best to address your questions, but please know that any that are not answered live will be provided in the Q&A summary in the email you will receive following the program. In this email, we will also provide a list of export markets for the wineries represented. Now I'd like to introduce our host, Elaine. In addition to writing for her own site, Waka Waka Wine Reviews, she serves as the American specialist for JancisRobinson.com and contributes to a long list of respected publications. She contributed to the eighth edition of the World Atlas of Wine, which has won multiple awards very recently as well as the award-winning fourth edition of the Oxford Companion to Wine. She was named by the International Wine and Spirits Competition and Vanilli as one of the top five wine communicators of the year in the world the last two years in a row. And Greg. Greg created his eponymous label Brewer Clifton with original partner Steve Clifton in 1996 and later designed Melville. Greg additionally created the Brewer Clifton label Diatom focusing on starkly raised Chardonnay, as well as Chateau Igai Takaha, which is marketed predominantly in Japan. Greg is credited for helping map, define, and establish the Santa Rita Hills appellation. Now, Elaine, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Katie. Hi, Greg, it's so good to have you. Thank you for having me, I'm excited. I am too. You know, I, I have to say that in my growth as uh, someone studying wine and getting to know wine and how how wine grows in different regions of the world and and understanding how wine tastes uh, Santa Barbara County and especially Santa Rita Hills has been so foundational to my to my study and my knowledge it's such a unique part of the world and I you know early on I just kept going back again and again and really trying to understand how things grow there and how things work because it was clear to me if I could come to understand Santa Rita Hills and Santa Barbara County, it would really improve and inform my understanding of wine growing everywhere. Oh, wow. And, awesome. Yeah. And when, when you uncover that, let me know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's an ongoing process for sure. But, um, but it's really, you know, it truly, the region truly has helped my thinking about wine more broadly. And the truth is, you know, I started meeting with you, tasting with you, and, and really spending a lot of in-depth time talking about Pinot and Chardonnay especially, and that's really informed my thinking about wine more broadly too. So it's really quite an honor to, to be able to share a conversation with you with everyone. Thank you. No, the honor is mine. I'm thrilled to be here. Oh, thank you. And it's especially, it's it, for me, it's very important and very special to be doing this series specifically for markets across Asia. It's really quite an honor to be welcomed into the learning process um, with people in these countries. And so I thank you for making time for all of us. Of course. Great, thank you. So one of the things that 
is so remarkable about Santa Rita Hills is it is it really is you know a world class region for Pinot and Chardonnay yet it's incredibly young you know vines were only planted there for the very first time in the 1970s and you know you start making wine in the region really quite early um, and and get started in the 1990s and not a lot of growth had happened from the first vineyard in the 1970s to when you arrive in the 1990s and so you really have played a, a very important pivotal building role for the region and i i wonder if you could speak for a little bit about how you see your role in the santa rita hills of course yeah i, I think I feel really, I, I feel huge gratitude for my timing, right? Which was, which was luck. I mean, you know, no one, no one, frequently people don't define or determine when they're going to kind of introduce themselves yes. into the world or into an area. And, and fortunately for me, I happened to get a job um, at a local winery in 1991 while I was still teaching French at the university. And, you know, in that vineyard at Santa Barbara Winery, um, is, you know, a couple of miles down the street and, you know, I've devoted 30 years of my life to that. But what's interesting about that is that, you know, I hit it when it was still very young. It was still very dynamic. It was still very kind of like undiscovered, like a secret spot, right? Um, at the same time, there was a generation before me to which I owe everything really, you know, Richard Sanford, Bruno D'Alfonso, Jim Clendenin, Adam Tolma, other Brian Babcock, people that were really on the front lines. They were the ones like knocking on the door, telling people around the world about Santa Barbara. So they, they opened the door, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I happened to be right behind, not even right behind, but swiftly behind. So if you think of it like a relay race, you know, the, the gun goes off, <laughs> they take off, you know, they're kind of getting their sea legs, so to speak and I get the baton on that second leg, right. <laughs> right? which is a very exciting thing because they really did the hard part. And then I really took advantage of, um, or enjoyed, I should say, the advantage of, it wasn't predatory, <laughs> I enjoyed the advantage of kind of the upswell in the area. Right, because, the momentum building. Yeah, all, like all the planting that happened in the mid 90s, the mapping of the Appalachian in the later 90s, the, the, you know, the um, approval of the Appalachian in 01, the movie Sideways in 05. I mean, it was like this perfect storm of circumstance where the door had been opened. And then over those 10 or 15 years, you know, it was kind of kicked open more broadly. Right. And so that was really a, cele a, a celebration. I mean, it was an extremely dynamic, extremely exciting era to be here for sure. For sure. So as we continue, I want to make sure that that everyone that's listening can can really take in our whole story. So I'm going to ask if we can slow down our, our speaking just a little bit as well. Sure. Uh, there's so much there's so much good information to to grab and glean here. And so I want to make sure people can really take it in. So it's, but yeah, I mean, it's really remarkable to look back because, you know, it's weird to say a movie can have such a profound effect, but part of what Sideways did was, you know, it opened the door to the greater world understanding Santa Barbara County for Pinot Noir, but that worked because people like you and the generation before that you mentioned were already there really building the foundation to make for Pino to be there and then really take off with that movie. Yeah, and again, it was really a, a combination of circumstances, right, that informed all of those outcomes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, did the movie play a role? Of course. Did the kind of publicity behind the Appalachian get attention? Of course. Did the messaging behind the Appalachian being very deliberately and specifically anchored in Chardonnay and Pinot from an extremely cool, steady, unique environment. That helped. All of the work, you know, particularly Jim Clendenin, who spent dec you know, decades in Japan, <laughs> specifically promoting and telling the story, Japan, Asia, all over the world, you know, as a, in that ambas you know, ambassador role that he still does daily. Um, that was critical, you know, to the awareness. And so all of those pieces assembled together, I think really helped to kind of lift up our ship, so to speak. Yes, yes. Well, and, and um, it's important to recognize how much of a community project 
growing a region is in that way. And that said, you know, you are also being a, a bit humble. And the truth is that you have played a crucial role in the development of some of the really important vineyards of the region. You know, and we're going to get the chance to talk about those a little bit today, too. So may, let's go ahead and look at where in the world we're talking about. Um, Katie, if we could go ahead and pull up the first two maps. So um, we're, of course, talking about California. You can see there, um, you know, we're, it's still, we're looking at Santa Barbara County there. Katie's put a box around the area of the world that we're going to zoom in on in the second map. Notice it is the central coast of California but it's very much the southern part of the central coast of California and kind of verging into almost to what we would call Southern California, but not quite. The second map though is so, is so beautifully done in that you can really see the texture and topography of the region. And we're really focusing in on specifically the Santa Rita Hills Appalachian, which um, Katie is going to go ahead and circle there for us. You can see though the broader Santa Barbara County area here and of course Santa Maria Valley is an important part of it as well but today we're focusing in on um, Santa Rita Hills there the southern of the two Appalachians and we'll and um, you know Greg you've actually established these four vineyards that are highlighted there Mikado, Hapgood, uh, Paraloon and 3D and that that really factors into the wines that we're talking about today could you comment on those a little bit? Sure of course so Really, you know, I've, um, like I said, I have worked solely, really and singularly on, on one highway, on one road that runs, you know, right through where the green laser just kind of circled. Um, and, you know, I think when, when one in life, when one weds oneself, when, when one really espouses oneself to a significant other or a stretch of land, um, I think there's an intimacy that can be gained with that stretch of land. And I think, you know, I'm being a product of Santa Barbara County professionally. Um, I was kind of born and raised in this, it's, a, it's almost like a, a fishing area, right? Like you, you go to the same spot <laughs> because right. you know the landscape. You, you likely recognize that other spots are equally beautiful and dynamic and rewarding and nourishing. However, you've got your, your home, your home, environment and this one is mine right so you know along that one corridor of Santa Rita Hills you know we've we've arrived at these four different vineyard sites that we've planted over the past 15 years more or less um, and they now kind of you know fulfill all of our needs uh, for, for all of our wines um, most importantly the Santa Rita Hills Chardonnay and the Santa Rita Hills Pinot Noir mm -hmm. that we're really addressing tonight. Well and so let's just highlight a couple points on the map and then we can look at a photo and then get back to the conversation. So it's important to point out here, of, of course, we're seeing the very green hills and mountains in the map. And what I want to make sure is emphasized is that you'll notice that the, the real spine or core of the coastal range is east of the Santa Rita Hills. So that there um, to the top right of the, of the map that we're looking at, you can see this bank of mountains. And that's really important because it protects the region from the hotter inland areas that are even further east. But what happens then is as you focus then back down to Santa Rita Hills, notice that it's fully open to the ocean. There's actually no mountain barrier between the Santa Rita Hills and the ocean. And what that means is that the region stays really profoundly cool. The, the ocean current that comes down the, the coast of California there and, and spins off right along Santa Barbara County is one of the coldest ocean currents in the world. And it, that cold ocean current creates cold weather that fills the Santa Rita Hills every day with incredibly cold fog and after, cold afternoon wind. And one more thing I want to point out with this map is that you'll notice that each of the four vineyards, Katie, if you could highlight those again, each of the four vineyards in Santa Rita Hills are on the northern portion of the Santa Rita Hills Appalachian, which we call the highway corridor. And so that's what um, Greg is referencing, that, that he's really spent his time in the northern corridor, the highway corridor of the Santa Rita Hills. And so it's a very specific area that you've wed your your career to. And it's really quite a beautiful evocative area. If we could look at the photo, it really gives a beautiful actually, feeling. 
If you don't mind, um, oh, I'm trying to jump in. Katie, if, if we can hold on to this one. Yeah, yeah please, yeah. So just to kind of keep riffing off of your comment, I think frequently there's, when, when, when one thinks of Santa Barbara, there's imagery of resorts and, call, you know, kind of escape and vacation, that type of thing, which is certainly the case down in Santa Barbara proper, which isn't even on this map. It's about an hour away. And however, up here, like by, you know, by where it says Brewer on the, on the coastline there, the, the ocean here is very savage. I mean, you touched on it a little bit being very cold, but really it's coming down, you know, from your neighborhood, <laughs> so yeah. to speak, you know, down from Alaska and it's coming down and it's, it's cold, it's windswept, it's ferocious. And I think particularly, you know, the, you know, with, with, you know, many of the, the guests that are joining us tonight, the role of an ocean plays a critical role in everything that we do, right? It informs our, our well-being, it informs our livelihoods, it informs our sustenance. Um, Japan's a wonderful example. It's essentially the same size and shape as California and, and you know, that all the different bays and harbors and wind, everything else. And so here we've got this huge cold body of water and we're respiring that day in and day out, as you mentioned, right? We're breathing that. The soil is marine driven. It's sand, it's plankton, it's empty, it's stark. Um, and a very cold, a very cold sea, a very steady climate. Um, and that enables us to kind of render these wines in this kind of saline, savory, kind of high tension, um, kind of oceanic marine driven voice that they all deliver. Yes, I well, and I, um, let's go ahead and look at the, next photo and then get back to that part of the conversation because there's so much to talk about there. But the, the area, it, I love this image though because it shows how the region is this combination of profoundly open and yet um, there's something kind of barren and savage about it like you were just describing at the same time. And, and you know, it is so exposed to that cold ocean. And um, so I love the, Im the image of this photo because it, you can imagine the winds sweeping through the area and, and yet there's something um, kind of warm and um, just present about it at the same time. It's really quite special, I think. But I wanna go ahead and talk about what you were just saying with the ocean. It's something, you know, one of the things I love talking about wine with you, it, it's, um, it's so easy to get up, get caught up talking about technique and get caught up talking about clones, especially with Pinot. But I know for you, you're of course well aware of the techniques you choose, well aware of the clones that you've planted. But for you, uh, my understanding is that it's really more about winemaking as a discipline and a way of thinking and, and, a, and a, an opportunity to kind of bring attention of opulence and flavor with structure and form through your wines. Could you speak to that a little bit? Of course. So really um, with, with us, you know, when, when, you, when you have confidence in an area, right? When you have confidence in your raw materials, there's an opportunity to be very subtractive with the upbringing of those materials. So um, with the, the upbringing of those materials. So in that regard, you know, for us, it's, it's all about removal of self. It's about quieting my voice. It's about, sure, there's technique. You know, we get from A to B. I mean, just like a chef would use a certain oven or a set of knives or a stovetop. It's, it's, it's critically, it's important, but it's not critical ultimately. I think the provenance is what makes us really the most important. And so in that regard, that's our whole thing is, is ritual and, and doing things the same year in and year out in a very need blind we're not imposing ourselves we're not the arbiter of anything we're not really the judge of anything we're simply raising all of these things with a very steady deliberate confident hand and a gentle hand really the same way year in and year out so that our role is diminished our importance is kind of our voice is silenced our importance is kind of put aside a little bit and one can do that in an area such as ours, where you mentioned the cold and the fog. With, with such frequency, cold and fog are associated with kind of a, a more erratic weather pattern, right? And, and, and normally warmer is associated with a more steady pattern. Here we have a very unique juxtaposition of circumstance where we have cool and kind of quiet and foggy and steady. 
And that's really, that's the magic behind Santa yeah. Rita Hills. Well, and, and the important thing to point out there too, is that combination actually creates one of the longest growing seasons in North America, certainly, but even in the world. And, and the reason that matters is because there's a way in which that very long, slow, steady, cool growing season really locks in the flavor. And I think really creates um, a kind of natural density to the wines. That's not about weight in the, in the mouth or palate, but really just about there's so much flavor that's all present and complexity and detail of flavor as well. One of the things though, you know, so speaking to technique a little bit, you've really made a commitment from the beginning with, to whole cluster with Pinot Noir. And I know that in a growing region like Santa Rita Hills and Santa Barbara County, that actually demands very specific farming techniques, but also a careful awareness in the cellar. Could you speak to how your work with whole cluster informs both the farming and the cellar choices? Of course. Yeah. So whole cluster fermenting. So normally with red wines, um, as probably many people know that are joining us, um, the, the grapes are moved from the stems and they ferment that way, which is similar to a fillet of something, taking the flesh off of the skeleton and, and producing it that way. Whole cluster fermenting is similar to cooking a protein with a skeleton. So chicken breast on the rib or a whole fish or meat with a bone in not better or worse than a boneless, skinless filet, just different. And so for us, because of the long season that you mentioned, Adam, um, the steady season and the, the control of the clones and everything that we have, um, it, it enables us to kind of have this proportion very, very appropriate for whole cluster fermenting. So just like the proportion of the chicken breast on the rib cage is important, right? You can't have a little tiny chicken breast on a huge rib cage, it doesn't work. Um, the, the relationship of that proportion has to be in equilibrium. That we're always striving towards that as well. And, and the reason why we do that is that for us, that raising the whole system as a complete unit, uh, for us anyway, is a way to really demonstrate place. Right, so Santa Rita Hills Pinot can be, as you mentioned, very dense, very intense. Um, it can be lush and dark and very sensual and beautiful. And that's a great way to render the Pinot and that's a great way to express our area. By going whole cluster, you're framing that fruit a little bit, right? You're, you're, the wines are rendered a bit more stern. They're more, um, there's a little spice aromatically that's a derivative of the stems. And, and then on, in the mouth, there's a savory tea-like kind of yes. presence and texture and architecture that's a derivative of the stem's participation in the system. Um, and so that's, that's the reason why we do it. So it's a way to kind of corset the fruit, to frame the fruit, just like if you have a soft protein, right? So if a piece of um, ahi thing that's jet, that's sear, or a scallop that's seared, you're not cooking the protein, you're barely even warming right, the protein. Right, right. You're, you're framing the protein. Right. That's what stems do for us. Yeah, no, that's exciting. I, um, well, and it's so interesting too to, to think about choices in winemaking in comparison to choices in cooking because it helps create a way of understanding, you know, why are we doing something like whole cluster and that idea of, you know, searing the fish. You simply sear the fish. It kind of locks in the flavor, gives it a frame and, and, acts as a counterpoint to that like soft opulent flesh of, of the meat at the same time. But I know you've, you've talked with me about having to do things a little bit differently in the vineyard to make sure the stems from the whole cluster are ready for the work in the cellar. Could you comment briefly on the farming side? Of course. Yeah. So, you know, the sites that we've selected are critical that the soils have to be appropriate. Um, and then the clones of Pinot um, are also, there are certain clones that are a little bit lighter and spicy inherently in the clonal material themselves, which is great in and of themselves. For us, however, we rely more on clones that are kind of more lush, again, more, cur more curvy, more round, right? Because mm -hmm. we need the circle in order to raise it with the square. Right. right? Uh -huh. That's your thing. So there's that. And then um, we, we completely remove the leaves that grow throughout the fruit zone 
very early in the process, right after the fruit sets, so that the, there can be sun penetration in the kind of interior of those stems. And then the wind flow and the sun, the morning sun in particular on those stems throughout the long growing season to kind of mature the stems in concert with the maturing of the fruit. And then a very sharp implement um, for the harvest time so that the, the cut is very um, sharp and not jagged. Think, yes. think of the sushi bar, mm -hmm. right? You, yeah. you can get through a fish this way, but it's ideal for one gentle pass with a sharp blade. And so that's employed to what we do. And then in the winery, there's really no equipment, you know, to speak of with red wine. So um, the, the, the fruit comes into our cold room, which is about as big as this living room, Whoa. as big as this living room. Um, and, you know, we chill the fruit overnight at about, you know, close to zero degrees Celsius so that the, the severance of that stem can dry up as well, like yes. a scab wood or a flower wood um, before it enters into any liquid. And then the following day, we dump into our small little fermenters. And so it's all very gentle and it's all, it all makes sense, right? It's all kind of cradled and um, because with whole cluster, you know, the, the downside potentially is an element of something that's maybe a little bit green or yeah, sappy. we never want the whole cluster to outrun the fruit, right? We just want this quiet, spicy, kind of <clears throat> curious, intriguing, evocative X factor in the wine, right? That, that's, that's our target anyway. And so all of those steps along the way are important. And, and the real goal of all of those is to be able to use something that's a little bit risky to employ at the levels that we do. Yeah, so just to comment briefly on some of the things you mentioned, we know through different sorts of vineyard studies that when the fruit and stem zone are exposed early, they in a way create their own protection and so the fruit, um, the skins become a little bit thicker. They, that, that keeps them from anything like sunburn. It increases some of the savory character as well. But also like you're saying that really careful cut on the stems and then allowing the stem to dry keeps, keeps the stem influence about the kind of spice flavor rather than the sap inside the stem. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's one of the things, you know, if we could go ahead and pull up the slide on the Pinot, that's one of the things I really admire about your Pinot Noir, that there is this, this sense of um, innate spice. There's still a generosity of fruit, but it, there's so much tension between the fruit character, the frame, and then this kind of that tea, spice, savory element, and even a sense of oceanic saline, not a saltiness, but um, you know, the, a kind of oceanic umami element um, that's always consistently in your Pinot. And, and so it's really, stems play this crucial role, but it's not a stemmy wine. And I think seeing that stems can be used in that kind of way is really, it's just a beautiful reminder of how much is possible with Pinot. So, but looking at your Pinot, what, what kinds of foods do you really love to enjoy this, this wine with? Well, I mean, really, really anything. I mean, you know, that one thing about Chardonnay and Pinot is, is the huge versatility. And I think wines, you know, you, you touched on a couple of beautiful comments, you know, as you always do, um, with regards to kind of an oceanic element to the wine, um, and also the, the, a savory, spicy, kind of tea-like element to the wine. And so, you know, thinking about the wines being beneath the food, right, being a condiment to the food, mm -mm -mm. a finishing element to the food. Think about, again, like a reduced sauce of something, right? let's say it's a you know fruit based salt whatever it is but kind of reduced down and then mm -hmm. you know an herbal element introduced into that sauce right a sprig of rosemary or whatever it is um and then that finishing the dish right this wine kind of does that you know it's it's yeah, not absolutely there's crazy intense fruit and power so there's a cleansing thing there's a there's a beauty to it there's a a generosity to the wine and there's a, a savory underpinning to the wine, which keeps it quiet, right? So that it can be a humble steward to the dish, right? Because I think sometimes with wines that are very, very fruity, they can be beautiful and they can go with a lot of things. But with some frequency, if, if, they, if they don't have a savory underpinning, sometimes they can yes. clap a little bit with food. <clears throat> Whereas a spice is a spice, right? And so this spicy, savory element to the Pinot, which is inherent a little bit in the appellation and then kind of exaggerated even more by our approach 
um, I think really, it, you know, it keeps the swine open to anything, you know, Asian food, I think is beautiful. I mean, anything that just, and, and there's a, there's a sincerity to our area. There's a raw, carnal, kind of sincere voice, I think, to everything that comes out of our area. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think there too, with, with cuisine that is raised with that same spirit of just capturing nature, harnessing nature and doing things in a very raw, deliberate way, um, I think the, the marriages are infinite. Yeah, sort of a pure food um, pairing mm -hmm. rather than really, um, overmade dishes but kind of straightforward simple food and um, one of the things that really is standing out to me and tasting the pinot right now too we talked about how it's such a long growing season and that that creates a natural density to the to the flavors and the thing is like it's also an incredibly long finish and there's i love your point though about the there being a quietness to the wine because there's really this um incredible combination of of strong presence but uh gentle fortitude if that makes sense that it's such a long finish it is such a persistent presence but it's not and it, and there's um plenty of amplitude plenty of plenty of presence but it's not forcing itself on you at the same time and finding that all together in a glass of wine is quite exciting but the other thing that i had that hadn't struck me at first but there's even this sort of orange peel accent like a bergamot orange peel accent that um like may like lights my head up a little bit makes me want to keep going back to the wine it's this wonderful surprise a little fresh note and and so it's just um your you know your conversation your comments about wanting to purely express the region you know by returning again and again to similar practices it's um it's fun to be able to taste these wines through multiple vintages and see how that shows up yeah and i think i mean that was such a huge compliment that you paid towards the wine as far as you want to go back to it like it it unveils itself to you kind of slowly and deliberately mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. it, kind of, it, it gives you different things it's like a flower opening up right like the ones behind me and, and i think that's with whole cluster and with raising these wines ultimately in very, very, very old, totally neutral barrels. There's an opportunity for the wines to be vulnerable, right? Not fragile, but yes, vulnerable, yes. Uh -huh. vulnerable, right? Uh -huh. And so that, that's how I think you, you can open up little like secrets, like little doors, right? It, it, um, because there's an opportunity for that kind of, something's out of place, that wabi-sabi, something's maybe a little bit imperfect about the wine, right? What is that? Is that orange peel? Is that spice? Is that something else? That's what I love about wine in general, right? Because mm -hmm. there's, there's, an in, there's an intellectual intrigue to go back to the wine. There's a drying sensation, you mm -hmm. probably feel right now, mm -hmm. that, that encourages you to go either back to the wine or to food, but it, in, it's an invitation to come back to something, right? Um, and that's another reason, a, a very kind of deep rooted reason why whole cluster has always been such a priority for us for the past 25 years. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. So we should keep, keep talking too about Chardonnay. Um, you know, one of the things that when I got started in wine, I didn't realize how much I would fall in love with Chardonnay. It, um, I'd always liked some Chardonnays, but the truth is I hadn't spent a ton of time thinking about it or worrying about it, so to speak. And, and yet, um, you know, I, when I started meeting with you, you've devoted so much of your life to Chardonnay. And in fact, even across multiple labels and across multiple expressions and styles. And that really kind of opened up, you know, now, so weirdly enough, Chardonnay's become like kind of an area of specialization for me. It's become this like pivotal. <laughs> yeah, it's become this pivotal part of my career in wine, you know. But I think that um, you know we're looking at your Santa Rita Hills Chardonnay, and um, you know you have very specific views on how you work with this. And there's really very much a parallel to how you think about Pinot that it it really is about that again that intersection of opulence and flavor with tension and frame. But of course, you can't derive that in Chardonnay through something like whole cluster. So could you speak to how do you approach that? With sure. So with Chardonnay, again, you know, our, our whole, everything that I do professionally is devoted to kind of neutrality and, and very old vessels. And I think there's, 
you know, tremendous reverence for things that are old. I think old things tell stories, right? Um, you know, just there, there's something really beautiful about something that's been utilized before. And so, and there's also, you know, for us, again, this confidence in the landscape, so as to kind of raise it under this very kind of stark magnifying glass, which is how these wines are ultimately done. And so in the case of the Chardonnay, um, you know, it's picked, you know, all, all of those vineyards kind of comprise the Chardonnay, picked over about a five, six week period, just like the Pinot, it's a very long, huge aperture of picking opportunity for us here. Um, and, and then the wines are done in the simplest way possible. Really, they're just pressed. The juice is settled overnight at a cold temperature, gravity down to very old barrels, and that's it. Um, no disturbance of the lees, really no malolactic. The barrels are 15 to 25 years old. Um, but here too, you know, with the Pinot Noir, we referenced, or I referenced like a, a circular starting point of lush fruit framed by the Cartesian yeah. stems, right? In the case of Chardonnay, I, I see white wines also through geometry, um, but more like an hourglass. And so if you reflect on it, a growing region such as Champagne, beautiful, amazing region, frequently the weather's challenging. And so they're starting in the small part of the hourglass with a lot of pitch and a lot of treble and a lot of that brightness. And then there's a need to kind of go outward mm -hmm. to tenderize that, right? Mallow, time on tirage, dosage, they're all outward in movement. For me, in my head, we're starting at the bottom of that hourglass. We're starting with base. We're starting with amplitude. We're starting with power, horsepower, bottom end, right? We're starting there. The wine is raised this way towards the point, right? right. Cool mm -hmm. ferment, neutral, no stirring, no mallow. Those are all endeavors to kind of maintain something high strung. And so that's how this is done. So the weight and the fruit intensity and the exoticism and that kind of explosive voice of fruit is all from the vineyard. And then again, it's, it's, it's like, it gets into the winery and then it's a very cloistered, very stark, very kind of tightly held approach, right? Because right. we're starting with something fatty, we need to keep it propped up, right? That's how we see it. Well, and the Chardonnay too, it it's, has that really um, interesting combination of it. The flavor does really spread across the palate and it even has this kind of, um, I'm having a hard time coming up with the word. It's not that it's an oily texture, but it, it really, it wants to coat the mouth. There's something almost unctuous about it. But then at the same time, it, there's this laser line that runs down the middle and really is a very vertical wine. And, and so that spread and uprightness combination in one, in one glass, you know, is really quite unique and exciting to find. And it's an interesting answer. You know, I think, in wine, we often assume a wine can either be delicious or it can be serious. You know, it can either be really ripe or it can be really early and lean. And we forget that it's possible to grow and make wine in a way that brings those things together. And I really see your wines as about that overlap, that intersection where it's like, no, I, you know, when I taste the Chardonnay, it's saying, I want to give you pleasure and I want to give you attention. I want you to enjoy and i want it to be serious enjoyment <laughs> right you know? well i mean you you opened up a beautiful kind of opportunity for some conversation and that that that's really the interesting part right to anything art fashion food music car design flower i mean that anyone anyone can bookend something right i mean you know, one can do something very lean and clean and tight and whatever, and then one can be really hedonistic and over the top on this side. The fun part is finding, finding equilibrium, right? And you can call it balance, you can call it tension, you can call it whatever you will. But, you know, again, thinking about proteins, thinking about food, if you, if you think about like a beautiful lobster claw, right? I, I use this analogy with frequency. You know, if you start with something very valuable and very luxurious, like that beautiful lobster claw. So now, you know, we, let, we leave you in Alaska, we're in Maine, whatever, we got our lobster claw. And, and there, there, you know, you have a couple of opportunities. You can go sous vide, butter, cream, something very decadent, very New Year's Eve, very hedonistic, and that's okay. You can take the same lobster claw, or maybe the other one, and, and you can slice it very thin, 
yuzu, mm. sushi bar, transmit, you know, and all of a sudden it's still valuable. It's still luxurious. Right. But it's, it's, it has that, it's more vertical to it's use. It's about precision. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's the same protein, right? But you, and it's still very luxurious. It's still very fatty, but it, le it, it takes you down a completely different path. And that's really been the inspiration with this wine is not, not leaving anything out in the vineyard. I mean, I really, we really want to capture a, a very hedonistic, a very dynamic wine. All the, all the while relying on the acidity that we have. Yes. Um, and also that saline tendency that is always in Santa Rita Hills. And so if you think about, and I loved your oil comment, it's totally true. Oil, wax, there's an oily, greasy kind of element to the wine and the acidity and the saline part, right? And so think about all of that happening at the same time is super exciting, I think. And again, thinking about those elements with food, right? They're condiments. Think about the things we've talked about, lemon, salt, they're, they're, they're things that lift food. They're things that can go with ultimately any food. They, they finish food. They, they kind of, they, you know, they complete, it's like a dance, like two dancers. I mean, the wine kind of, it catches the other dancer when, you know, he or she falls. I mean, that's, that's the whole point of it. And so I think Santa Rita Hill Chardonnay is just a beautiful companion in that type of role. Yes. Um, you know, somebody's asking about your choice with neutral oak too, but I mean, thinking my way into these wines, there's, su there's this really um, pivotal balance of that opulence and the, and the structure, you know, so the ten it's, they're really teetering on that, the tension of those two things coming together. And it occurs to me that adding oak flavor would tip it over, you know, that, that the neutral, your use of neutral oak is in a way, a way to respect, this is what the place gives us. And this is the way to keep that really delicate tension balance in the wine as well. Absolutely. It, it's no different. You know, I love, especially, you know, all the education that, you know, we both do, certainly you, you know, um, but it's, it's the exact same. I think people, there's, there's a, if, if it's reflected on in a way of like bass and treble and music, it's the same thing, right? It's just, we're a t two children on a teeter totter, <laughs> you know, it's like it, in order for it to be in equilibrium, you know, you, you might have two small kids here. You need a big one over here <laughs> to keep it to keep it all in check. And so, same thing. We're we're picking the fruit when the tendency would be more bass. You know, think about an orchestra. It would be more cello and bass and tuba and more kind of there. But then the up the 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 score that we're playing has has the treble there. You know, it's a higher pitch, higher frequency score, and that's why it works. Right. right, because if if you have those instruments with the bass turned up, it's just like a yeah, it's too much. Uh, too much. Similarly, yeah. if you if you only have a piccolo and the treble is tuned up, that too is n is not appropriate. Right. And so the fun part for us, anyway, and and it's and and what that equilibrium is is different for everybody and for every wine, um, but for us, this this kind of these parameters have always seemed appropriate, and we've we've never wavered from that. Yeah, so one of the other questions that's coming in, I think people are asking about acidity and pH, but I think um, to step back and give broader context in, in response to that question, something that a lot of people don't realize is that the area of the world that you're growing in really comes in from the get-go with really high natural acidity levels. And, um, you know, Northern California has a situation where, um, winemakers have to really carefully hurry up and pick before the acid drops away. But Santa Barbara County in general has very much the opposite sort of situation where the acid levels stay high for so long that winemakers are almost forced to let the fruit hang longer to allow the acid to levels to drop low enough that the wine can be in better balance. And part of that I take it is because it is such a cool steady growing season you know, one thing we know from vineyard studies is that acid levels drop through the respiration of the vine, but that in a colder region and a windier region, the vine simply can't respire to the same degree. And so the acid levels stay higher in the fruit. And so, um, you know, one of the questions that came in is, uh, you know, in a many cases, whole cluster does naturally increase the pH of the wine, 
but actually in a growing region like yours where acidity levels are so naturally high that can actually be a rebalancing it could be a good thing so would you comment on that a little bit sure yeah i mean everything everything is important and and you know like you said you know the the, the cold evenings you know kind of stop the vines, you know, they kind of go into self-protection mode. And when the wind velocity, when the wind speed gets as, as fast as it gets almost every afternoon, there too the vines kind of close the doors, so to speak, and they, and they preserve themselves and they, may, they retain that acid. And so, you know, we, we rely on that absolutely, you know, and, and to have a high acid area, that's also a very predictable fall area, is is a beautiful circumstance right because you know i i normally some of the chardonnay we're having tonight we picked in november yeah which is incredibly november, late yeah very in late, November, but it's very common i don't know of a year when i mean there may have been a couple of years but for the most part i always pick chardonnay some chardonnay the first couple of weeks of november um because i know that i can because there's no pressure because of challenging weather coming our way so um, that too, I think, is a, another reason why all of the wines of our area have this very kind of unbridled intensity to them, um, because you can really you can really do anything you want. I mean, there's this, there's like again this perfect storm of circumstances, you know, with this long steady season and these really high acids that we have. Yes, and so I mean, I think, you know, one of the things that comes naturally from your region too is again that longer hang time does shift the sugar development um, to some extent. And, you know, in my mind, your, your wines really are beautifully balanced. There is that, again, that kind of um, perfect sort of delicate teetering of tension, you know, of flavor to spice to acidity to freshness. And, um, you know, I'll admit there's just a very slight warming element to the wines too, but be, be with those other combinations of flavors, I think that's the perfect accent. You know, it's a perfect accent for the wine. And so, you know, I think in, in the last 10 years, there's been a, a um, really profound shift around how we talk about alcohol. But in a, one of the things I think it's important to point out with Santa Barbara County and Santa Rita Hills is that because of that growing, long growing season, because of that elevated acidity, capturing balance in many cases depends on having just a little bit of warmth um, like your wines do. I think that's a really, um, it's a really beautiful balance, but it's also a way of saying, you know, no, if we're com really are committed to making wines of place, as you've been describing, your commitment is to making wines that express Santa Rita Hills, that is what you're doing with these wines. If you were to pick extremely early, you would literally have to deacidulate. You'd have to literally remove, unnaturally remove acid from the wine, which would upset the balance, I think. It, it would just be a whole different, it would be a whole different approach to the craft, right? Yes. Um, uh -huh. Again, think about, you know, the, the parameters, the parameters, think about like an ahi tuna, right? Picture being at the fish market, and seeing a tuna being broken down from Akami to Chutoro to Otoro. It's the same study, right? It, it's, it's the same fish. So that fish is the same appellation, right? And if, you, if you're taking the meat off right. the, you know, the spine, the muscular red part of that tuna, that would be like early season and that's okay, right? And then the Chutoro gets a little more decadent and then the Otoro gets the most decadent, right? That's the same kind of chapters unfolding in our season as going through the flesh of that animal, right? Mm, and so, mm. and, and just like the flesh of the animal, the interpretation, depending on how lean the meat is or how fatty the meat is, how that meat is handled is gonna be important, right? And so that, that's really it, you know? So I'm, I'm going a little more towards the belly, yeah, uh -huh. the fish, yeah. um, but everything that we do, my whole life's work has been devoted to working solely with the belly of that fish. Right. It's, well, it's that same fish. Yes. And um, well, and I think it's, it's a really beautiful choice because, you know, you alluded to the idea of intimacy at the, towards the beginning of our conversation. And there's a, there's a profound depth of intimacy that you have from making this choice to really devote your life 
to understanding wine made in this way in this place and not even just in Santa Rita Hills but in the highway corridor this one band of of the Santa Rita Hills you know I have um I have I'm kind of an insatiably curious person, but part of how that's played out for me is a lot of looking around and moving around and studying lots of things. Um, but I have a lot of admiration for the kind of choice you've made to say, I am going to study lots of things, but in this very focused, devoted way here in this place, you know, and to really get to know this place intimately, you know, and to really see how different vintages change it and, um, and different evolutions over time and, and through aging all, all play a role. Yeah, yeah, I think um, I've, I've been reflecting on that more um, in the past five or 10 years. And I think there's something a little more monastic about my approach. It, it's not favorable. I mean, it, it's not for everybody, yeah. um, but it, it's resonated with me. And I think when, when you do that, you, you I, I think there's a recognition at a certain point that you make decisions that like, it's just, you just know, I mean, you just do things because you've always done it. You know what I mean? And, and you, um, you don't think about, you know, you, you see people picking at night, you see the lights on the tractors up in the hills, you know all the other vineyards, you know all the other colleagues, you know their tendencies, and that's kind of subliminal in your head. And you'll be like taking a walk or getting gas at the gas, and the wind will change, the light will be a certain way. And then it's like, oh, that's when I sample this vineyard. That's when right, we right. Uh -huh. get these triggers, um, because that's that's all I know. You know, it's almost like a, a case study in in someone doing something very kind of rigid that way. And then even you know, you you asked about it. I danced around the question a little at the beginning, but why you know along this one road of two forty six, and I you know the whole appellation I love. I've, I've worked with almost every spot at some point in my past thirty years and love them all. But there too, it's like my neighborhood is my neighborhood. So just like if you are taking a walk and you get a newspaper here and you get your baguette here and you, you know, you, you just stay in your very, very small bubble kind of. And I think there's something, there's, you know, it's a blessing and a curse. And I, I still, you know, we love wines from everywhere. I love wine, tasting wines from all over the place. It's not, you know, I'm, it's not blinders. Yes, yeah. Um, at the same time, you know, I put a, you know, a ring on this area. Right? <laughs> yeah. you know, this area is, is, I'm devoted to this area. And I think there's something very provincial about that. Um, that this has been, you know, the way, the way it's been. And it's been a fast 30 years. So <laughs> I, yeah. I don't see myself leaving now. <laughs> yeah. Well, so um, someone's asking too, what are your favorite foods to enjoy with the Chardonnay? Oh, really anything, you know, I think, you know, Chardonnay is, is so like, like the Pinot Noir, it's so versatile. And you think about, you know, lemon and salt and lime kind of tendencies, and there's a, a transparency to Chardonnay that I think enables it to speak so clearly of place. And at the same time, that transparency enables it to be so versatile with food, right? So mm -hmm. certain, certain, you know, all white, all wines are cool, but certain white wines, the varietal voice of that white wine might be more specific. So I'm thinking about Sauvignon Blanc or Viognier or Gewürztraminer, or beautiful wines, but you know what they are. Right, right, right. right. Like, I'm Gewürztraminer, I'm, right. it's loud. Chardonnay is quieter, right, as a grape. And so I, I think it's just more, it just kind of goes where you want it to go. You know, I think it's really beautiful that way. Mm -hmm. Um, so one of the questions that's coming in, um, just as to answer quickly, you know, that they're asking if um, you end up with any kind of noble rot so late in the year. But actually, the my understanding is the region is dry enough. That's that's not really an issue at all. So. No, it's it's not really. I mean, it, it, I guess it, it could be, but it's it's not really. But but that's also, you know, we do have, you know, because it's so foggy, you know, we you know we we do have issues that we contend with. But again, if, if this is the only place you work, yes. <laughs> you, know, you know what's happening, right? And, yeah. so, um, and so that's another reason why we, we remove the leaves around the fruit zone as, as generously, as liberally as we do. It's to take advantage of our circumstance. So what do we have here? We have a long season. We have you know, a long growing season. We've got sunlight you know, after the fog kind of all the time and wind. Right. So if we can open up the fruit, right, to expose, to kind of take advantage of those elements, 
it stays very, very, very clean um, all the way through November, as I right. mentioned. Yes, because kind of too many leaves can kind of hold in the fog and the humidity and not allow the wind to get in and blow that wet air away. And that, yeah. that's what creates the mildew possibility. Yeah, and you mentioned that earlier today about the stem inclusion, right? And, and if, you, if you remove the leaves early, it kind of toughens up the skins. It kind of, it gets, it gets that system ready. It's like you, right. before you go to Mexico for vacation, you know, you, you get some tanning in before, right? Or some rugged Alaska salmon fish, you know, like right. you, you, get, you get weathered to the elements and then you're, you're prepared, your body is prepared to withstand those elements, right? Because that's, you're fishing for salmon in Alaska, for goodness sake, you know, so your hands get tougher and you're, whatever happens to your body. The same thing happens with these grape clusters, right? So we remove, we remove all this, the leaves early, the fruit gets acclimated to the circumstance, right? And then it's like, oh, I'm good. You know, so thicker skins, you know, a little more weathered and it gets accustomed to the wind and the fog um, and it keeps it super pristine. Right, so we're almost out of time, but just as a last question, someone's asking, are there, are there Asian cuisines in particular? Um, you know, and you have talked a lot about um, sushi and seafood, so perhaps there's a specific seafood pairing um, as an example that you really especially appreciate with the Chardonnay. No, it's really, you know, again, I don't, you know, with, at the risk of sounding too much like a diplomatic salesperson, I mean, it really, it's, it's, it's all of it, you know, all the times that we've spent in Japan and, you know, with friends here, I mean, it, it the, the cuisine is so intense and it's mm -hmm. so pure. Um, and think about, you know, the Chardonnay, again, think about this like saline yuzu kind of element in these wines and the Chardonnay. Think about with that food. I mean, anywhere where any food in Japan where you would employ yuzu or citrus or salt, <laughs> this wine would be an amazing companion. Similarly, with the Pinot Noir, right, there's this kind of savory, spicy, soy, hoisin, yeah. tea-like underpinning in the Pinot. There too, think about any cuisine, anywhere in the world for that matter, that would, would be enhanced by <laughs> spice, tea, poison, soy, <laughs> And, and all of a sudden, you know, the Pinot is your perfect fit. Yes. Well, and I think even um, like really just seared, very pure presentation of Wagyu um, would be a beautiful pairing with the, the Pinot too. I, I find it exciting when I, when I find a Pinot that can work with kind of fattier, denser fish, but also um, like really clean, light meat, you know, it's like that the kind of versatility there is really exciting. So we are out of time, but I, I really appreciate you making this time. It's, it's always such an interesting conversation with you and, and one that teaches me a lot about the wine itself, but also ways to think about the wine. And I think just your, your point of seeing, you know, winemaking really, in my mind, I, I hear what you describe as like winemaking has become a kind of life discipline for you so that it's not just the work that you do, but it's a kind of even a sort of spiritual and aesthetic personal practice and bringing, bringing all of that together is something I really admire in what you do. And so thank you for sharing some of that with all of us today. It's a huge compliment. And I feel the same about, you know, you, the line of questioning was so thoughtful and, and just, you know, specific to every, I mean, it was really awesome. It was fun. And thanks to all of the people who joined us. I think, you know, it's, it's so flattering and I never take that for granted. Um, so thank you to all of you who, who devoted an hour of your life um, to learn about <laughs> Rita and Santa Barbara. It's very, very, very meaningful and, and nourishing to me. And so thank you all sincerely. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Greg. And from the chat, it, everyone is super appreciative of this conversation. So thanks so much for taking the time. And to all our attendees for joining. And as a reminder, we will have a video recording of the webinar available to you in the next few days. So thanks all.